My name is Barbara Taylor. I'm the director of the Fales Library here at NYU. And on behalf of the Fales Library and the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development's Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health, and Clark Wolf, I'd like to welcome you to the second of our Critical Topics in Food series for 2007. Uh, we do a series of events each year, three events, uh, that highlight current topics uh, and sort of hot topics in the world of food. Um, here at NYU and, and uh, abroad, and so we'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, the reason why this is being held in special collections is about four years ago, we began to build a food studies collection here to support the work of students and scholars here at NYU and in New York City uh, at large who are working on various topics related to food. And I'm happy to say that from zero cookbooks four years ago to today, we have over 20,000 cookbooks and some 6,000 pamphlets and various collections of personal papers and other materials related to um, food, and especially focusing on food in New York in the post-war era and the changes that New York City made uh, to food, food culture throughout the US. Um, of course, none of this would be possible without the support of our faculty and colleagues over in food studies, and with uh, Clark, without Clark Wolf's help, who seems to have unlimited resources and energy and puts these events together for us each year. So if you've heard enough from me, I'm going to introduce Clark Wolf and help, uh, please help me, please join me in welcoming Clark. Thank you and good afternoon. School let out a little while ago, so I'm glad to see you all still here. <laughs> this is one of the uh, conversations that I have been wanting to have in public for a long time. And so we thought we'd invite people, as is my want, who know more than I do and uh, do more than I do and think more than I do to share their thoughts. Many of you are in front of me and have participated before. This wants to be kind of an ongoing conversation. Each of these conversations needs to stimulate us so that we think about a million more things we'd like to talk about or write a book about or give a course about or turn our entire career and life attention to. I want to mention a couple of things that have happened since we all last met and one of them is the first Pulitzer Prize ever for food writing was won by a food writer who wrote about restaurants all over an odd part of Southern California called Los Angeles and beyond uh, in a, a weekly giveaway alternative newspaper. Jonathan Gold is goofy <laughs> and brilliant and talks about everything we all have been doing and studying forever. It's an acknowledgment that our respect for structure and history and our ability to see beyond it and greater than that is what's powerful about food. It's the largest industry in the world and the smallest family of which you are all official members. And the most important thing, because as we may have noticed, if there's nothing to eat, we're dead. And I don't mean that politically. <laughs> and I don't mean that econo economically. I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, at the door, you have uh, a more portable version of this wonderful book, One to e uh, What to Eat by Mary Nussel. You may have read or heard that there's a new discussion about bottled water. I believe that discussion uh, hit the tipping point in this book, where she talks about the fact that water is good for you, but you don't need 18 gallons a day, you know, and you don't need it to be from an expensive plastic bottle. And so maybe this may be convenient, but it may not be the best use of our resources and our nutritional uh, energy. It's just a, a little nugget of wisdom that's all over the front pages of all the newspapers. We have them for sale. The bookstore does like their support. I also want to mention that uh, this book, OK, there have been a few books written about Julia Child. Uh, this one is the story. This is by a brilliant writer who's been part of our ongoing faculty, Laura Shapiro. Hi, Laura. You can, you can wave it. <laughs> there, there she is there. Uh, and what it, what it, the reason I like it is because this is a handful of really good thinking and really articulate history. And this is the kind of thing we ought to be able to pick up and have in our libraries. Uh, today's conversation started a long time ago. And uh, I'm going to end with Marion today because um, 11 and a half years ago, Kay. we had a long conversation 11. and a long walk from the yeah. Upper East Side that resulted in my committing to her efforts to reformulate the way people study about food. And so the Department of Home Ec, well, much before, but not that much before, that had become the Department of Nutrition, became the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies, 
and has become the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health. And by the way, I want to welcome the acting chair, Amy Bentley. Amy, please wave. This is the uh, person who, with her history, uh, her background in American studies, this is, a, this is a history professor in food, which is wonderful. She's marshaling <coughs> this period of time uh, in the department, and it's really wonderful. I want to mention what we're doing in October before we get into this conversation. The third of this series will be October 11th. It's a Thursday at 6, at 4. We have to be out by 6. The topic is chefs who grow their own. The more direct uh, uh, flight, or as it were, trajectory from earth to table. We will have Marion Burroughs, who's been covering these things for a long time. We will have Dan Barber, <coughs> who's been growing these things for a long time. We have uh, uh, Gus Schumacher, who has been making some of these things possible and valid for a long time. We have um, uh, Joe Bastianich, who's been growing and making wine and olive oil and supporting a couple of chefs. And this uh, woman from California named Alice something, uh, who seems to be on book tour and has agreed to be on the panel to talk about why farmers are important to her too. That day, that Thursday evening, will be followed by uh, a day that I've been hoping for for a long time called the Critical Topics Symposium. It'll be a full day, and it's sponsored by the department, this collection, and myself. And it's an invitation-only discussion day with four parts. The first will be about libraries and collections, how they're done, what they mean, how they're working, how we use them. The second will be about academic and other kinds of programs, what we're learning, where we're learning it, who we're with, from whom we are learning it, if I get that right. The third will be about other forms of expression. Why did Ruth Reichel do a supplement for Gourmet Magazine that was written all about food by writers with no commercials and no products? and was a huge hit with a million, uh, 1.2 million people and 300,000 special requests. Can I buy that? I'll give you extra money, which Condé Nast doesn't need. Um, and then the fourth will be about organizations and initiatives. Who's out there doing what, how that, this all relates, and how this information that we've been gathering and sharing with each other uh, actually is used in the real world. What a concept. We're going to be doing a, a, a couple of wonderful things. The keynote for that is a brilliant professor here at NYU, Barbara Kirschenbach Gimlet, who is known for her performance studies classes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what she's going to do. Food performance. Well, food performance, okay. I like my food to perform, <laughs> but not do flip flops. Um, Barbara was one of the first people to really integrate the study of food into another academic uh, discipline. And she's going to talk to us about how that happened. At lunch, we're going to do something really annoying. <laughs> We are going to present a suggested reading list. This has been a conversation <laughs> between a lot of people for a long time. <laughs> it will not be an official list. It will be a for talking list with four categories. Must read, must read now, should read, and could read. Should be a fun lunch, all right? But it's going to be prepared from my office by a number of um, master's student graduates, including my assistant, Tosca. Where are you, Tosca? There's Tosca. Um, who is going to be leading the charge, and it will be out there on the table for us to discuss. I know that uh, some of you uh, have written a couple of books that would might like to be on this. We will be accepting cash or roasted chicken rice. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next morning, if we have any energy at all, Marvin and Marion and I will facilitate a conversation of one to three hours uh, about where we should be looking and what we should be studying in the coming decade or two. So it promises to be a very I interesting time. Invitation only, and many of you in the room will be invited because of what you study and what you do and what you share. And if you've been on any of our panels, you will be invited. And we will have 20 spaces for those of you who are serious about wanting to participate and have been coming to these things. So if you want to be on that list, please fill, you put your name down on the welcome sheet and say, I want to come on the 12th, and we'd be thrilled to include you. OK, I'll shut up for the moment. And today, what we're going to talk about is th the trajectory, how it's changed. It used to be that if I wanted to look at a chef's resume to hire them for a restaurant, I wanted to see where they studied in France, you know, uh, did they go to Lausanne, uh, what Michelin restaurants did they work under, maybe I wanted them to go to Italy a little bit, that was a little bit later, uh, did they study with Giuliano or Marcella and know the home cooking that's, uh, now it's, um, how many restaurants have you worked at in Vegas? <laughs> have you been to New Zealand beyond kangaroo? You know, do you have a master's degree from NYU? <laughs> There's a whole new trajectory, and we really are beginning the conversation now, 10 years down the road, about your future. This also comes from a question that I've been asked by every intern and every assistant I've had in the last 10 years. 
what am I supposed to do with this degree? <laughs> well, ab absolutely anything. I mean, uh, again, it's our belief that uh, a BS, a master's, or a PhD in food studies is a great basis for anything in the whole world, including being the restaurant reviewer of the New York Times, should you wish to do that. <laughs> We're going to begin with a gentleman who I adore and who's a wonderful cook and who started out as an actor, or trying to be an actor. <laughs> well, I don't know. He does faceovers. And uh, uh, got a $250 scholarship from New York Tech that said he had to some promise in this cooking business, and uh, has cooked and led the, 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 uh, the kitchens of some legendary restaurants, uh, the 21 Club Windows in the World, and now has his own wonderful, wonderful uh, restaurant, Porterhouse, New York, and who is, after all these years, uh, an actor. Uh, because these days, um, a chef on their resume doesn't just need to show who they cooked with and for, but how they are in food fights, on morning television, and in their own traveling show. So please help me welcome Michael LaMonica. Michael, tell us a little bit, begin by telling us a little bit the short story of starting as an actor and ending on the Discovery and Tra Travel Channel and how that's worked for you. <laughs> well, you know, um, I, uh, I went to, I, I wanted to be uh, an actor since before college. I went to City University. I went to Brooklyn College and they had a really great performing arts department, a great theater department in the early 70s. And uh, I didn't graduate uh, until uh, two years ago, three years ago, but that's another story. No, but that's a good story. Uh, I dropped out in my senior year and I went on the road. I, I, I studied with some great people. I mean, academic uh, theater teachers there were really of a very high order, and uh, they were, it was really a great department to study theater, and speech and theater was my major. And um, when I uh, left school, I left school to uh, uh, actually to really go into the business and work. So, uh, you know, I was in a renegade production of Hair, I was in a bootleg production of Superstar, uh, traveled the country for, uh, for a year and a half in bus and trucks, and started to do uh, bit parts in movies. Uh, I still have my SAG card. I still have my equity card. Uh, pay my dues. Uh, you know, they used to give shoes away. Uh, equity will give you a pair of shoes a year because you know you're pounding the street. And um, and uh, you know, and as now an actor, he only wants clogs. no, no, no. So you know, so actors could apply it. That they could. So I, I always paid my dues because I always thought there was someone who could use that pair of shoes. So I pay my dues. So, um, but uh, the. The thing is, is that all of that time, I, I was on the road and I, I, uh, we, we did a show in New Orleans and we were there for uh, three or four days and I ate so much in those three days. I mean, honestly, at meals I would order twice because I couldn't believe what I was eating and that was the mid-70s and uh, it really occurred to me there was something going on with food of New Orleans that I had never experienced in Brooklyn. Grew up in New York. Um, I have two older brothers. They're both physicians both doctors. Um, in fact, half my family are doctors. And, uh, but uh, it, it, so it was really something. And when I came back to New York, I started to look for that food and really started to read and got into this whole stream of, of uh, a new American food or American cooking. And it was really the bicentennial, right? That was the bicentennial was really important to this. And it, I developed a love for food. So when I went back out on the road, we often stayed in, in uh, hotels that had, uh, you know, facilities to cook. So I started cooking and I was cooking and I cooked my way through my acting career until I really, uh, I got to be 27, 28 and I thought it's, it's time to make a, I was at a critical juncture because I could see what my life was going to be like. It was that constant series of, of looking for work and driving a cab, of which I still have my, I don't have my hack license, I still have it though. I don't drive a cab anymore. I still have that license though, you know. And um, um, I married my high school sweetheart and uh, it became a, a, a juncture of like, what do, do I really want to be driving a cab at 35 or is there something more important? And cooking and cooking for friends became more important. I read about Michelle Rustang. I read about the Rustang family, Joel Robichon. I read about this guy Wolfgang out in California. And there was this California revolution and it was the early 80s. And um, there was really, it wasn't very easy, I don't think. There was a guy called uh, uh, Larry Forgione. And uh, in fact, I... 
uh, proposed to Diane in the Ameri at uh, the River Cafe, and there was a new chef there, Larry Forgione. And uh, he had only been there for two months, and we, I proposed over, you know, we got engaged over one of Larry's meals. He since is a friend. So uh, it occurred to me there was something going on with food and reading that Wednesday section, and uh, there are some great people who still write for that Wednesday section who really know what food is all about and where it's, where it's starting, where it's going, where it's come, and where it is. And it inspired me. And uh, I found New York City Technical College in Brooklyn to have a, a hotel and restaurant program that they started after World War II for the returning vets. Wonderful. And uh, this year we raised $2 million to build a new kitchen. Uh, so next year that'll happen. I'm on the foundation over there to help do that, you know, to, you know, that because it's the same kitchen that I learned in that was the same kitchen that some of the vets from the Korean War learned in. So I thought, it's time for a new kitchen. And, uh, <laughs> Um, but it's um, uh, now it's called technical uh, technical college. But in any case, um, it there were very few options to learn the industry. Uh, one, you could go to Europe and sort of knock around, I suppose. But it wasn't really I, I didn't really feel it was an option. Married in a relationship, we could have moved upstate to uh, culinary institute. But I really felt very strongly that uh, I wanted to give uh, New York City Tech a chance. And in fact. Uh, almost the entire faculty at that time had worked at uh, um, the Four Seasons, Fonda del Sol. Uh, they worked at all these early RA restaurants, uh, restaurant associate restaurants, and they had uh, the pastry chef from the Plaza Hotel, uh, that kind of faculty. And uh, they gave of themselves, and in two years I had my next degree, which was hotel and restaurant management. And uh, in 1984, graduated, we went to Europe for a month. Uh, came home and started working, and I, I haven't looked back. I, uh, I went to work in, um, uh, you know, I, my first job was while I was in school, and uh, Rayo's is great, but I worked in the original mobbed up Italian restaurant. I worked at Monty's Venetian Room. Oh my God. Oh my God. Right next to the Gowanus Canal, <laughs> where on certain Saturday nights you'd hear a little splash and you'd go back to work. <laughs> Now they're dredging it, and well, you know where that goes. Monty's Venetian Room, where on Saturday nights, a big burly guy would come in every Saturday night like clockwork and order food for 12 to go. I didn't ask. But uh, it was a great background. You know, from there I graduated, and I was very, very fortunate. I went to Le Cirque as, a, you know, as an apprentice cook. I worked for Alain Sayac, who hired me. He left, and I worked for Danielle Ballou. And um, I spent my time, it was pretty good pedigree, because uh, honestly, as an actor, uh, I, I was very interested in the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, and they came to Brooklyn twice, and they did, um, you know, like summer sessions, so, you know, we got a chance to study with them. So classical background meant a lot to me. I'm an amateur musician, I was a music minor in college, and, um, you know, played violin in junior high school, and I, so classical training, classical music, classical cooking, these are the, I felt were structural to, and important to me for their structural integrity and that I wanted to use them. So learning French classic cooking was something I really wanted to do and that's what Le Cirque did. And um, from there I graduated to, um, to the 21 Club. Um, I worked for Daniel Ballou and then Alain went to op reopen the 21. And that was actually, so I was on that reopening crew as a sous chef. And uh, I worked for him for about a year and a half and left with Jeffrey Zakarian. And uh, we went to work for uh, Juana Leroy. I, I don't really know why we did that. <laughs> but uh, Jeffrey told me, we quit today. Jeffrey came to me one day, he said, we quit. <laughs> we quit? Yeah, we're going to work for Warner. I said, OK. And so, um, but a year later, uh, a year later, I was invited back. Okay, hold on a second. Do you all know Warner Leroy's background? Yeah. Anybody not know? Right, Mervyn Leroy, Hollywood. All right, so he went from Hollywood to Hollywood to Hollywood, actually, on a, on a regular basis. Go ahead. I worked at a fern bar. Maxwell's yes. Plum yep. was a fern bar, the original yes. fern bar. And, uh, but uh, a year later, I was invited back to 21 uh, and to be the executive chef. So it, after two years, there had been, you know, kind of people had come and, uh, you know, it, it had gone through its changes. And I spent, uh, I was there from 1989 to 1996. And in uh, 97, I joined windows on the world, and um, the last few years um, I helped to open a few restaurants, I wrote a cookbook, which was my second book, and um, I started working a year and a half ago on Porterhouse. In the meantime, 
other things happen. There you go. Thank you, Michael, for a, a moving intro. Let's hear it for him. Come on. Uh, I want to mention a couple of things. One is that Michael said that he worked with RA, Restaurant Associates. They were one of the first groups who actually did the kind of research, the kind of historical digging that we do it academically here. They really researched every fork and every uniform, and, and then they made things up based on that or on whatever they were drinking along with studying that. But, but there was a real formality that was invisible. It was a secret weapon that Joe Baum uh, imparted to everybody. And then I, I should also mention that Alan Sayak, who uh, was one of the people that uh, uh, Michael worked with, has become the Dean of Studies at the French Culinary Institute. Right. So these are people who came from kind of an education and who are now offering uh, a big piece of, of our community's education. So it's a start, and we'll get back to who's in his kitchen now and who's been in his kitchen and, and all the rest of that uh, in a moment. But I want to move on to our next speaker and our next guest, who uh, I got to say this is really wonderful, is the alum of the year from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, uh, Arts and Sciences here at NYU. Let's give a big round of applause for Florence Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, you know, Florence does not do a lot of these things, and I really appreciate her being here, sharing some of this stuff today. She couldn't say no because it was at NYU. She, you know, they're honoring her. She's got to show up. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no plaque today. But, um, the or thing, silver bowl. The, silver bowl, yeah. The thing that, that, the, that I would love to hear from Florence, or the many things that I would love to hear from Florence, have to do with her unique perspective. She's been writing about what's going on in restaurant kitchens in New York City for a very long time. She's been writing off the menu and also about foodstuffs that uh, come and go that are considered to be interesting or timely or news. I mean, she has to fight with editors coming and going, but it is she who writes in the New York Times, in the paper of record, the pedigree of a chef at a new restaurant. It may have been, came from the kitchens of Aunt Alain Sandorans, it may have been Michelin Two Star, and now it is she who has to say, used to work as a busboy at Mama Fuko, and is now the president of Queens College. I mean, I don't know, you know right, exactly, who, who butchered a, a large pig on Thursday and is now a borough president. You know, we don't know. So this, this critical analysis is really important. But also, Florence, with her background, which is uh, very academic French, which is not exactly a bad thing to have had when we all started learning about food in the, the 60s and 70s, uh, and then in the 80s, other things. Um, has a classical background, but also came uh, in her own trajectory uh, from the out from the outside. Uh, wasn't a staff writer. Is a is an, a regular columnist for the New York Times, which is its own arm wrestle, and has turned out to be an incredibly valuable dynamic for all of us who live in the world that uh, we read about. So Florence, first of all, thank you for coming. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you for I, having I me. Mention also, she's actually worked. She's done a bunch of books, but this one I think is really kind of interesting. Talk about social history and Marcel Proust on crack. Oh, I mean on um, uh, donuts. That's it. <laughs> She's writing something called Park Avenue Potluck. Uh, it's coming out, published by Rizzoli this fall, and I, I, well, I, we, we have to admit that her daughter is designing it, so uh, which is good. But it's all about uh, what goes on in those kitchens um, of those people that actually get the good tables. Uh, <laughs> right? Exactly. And so, it, from very, very serious things to things that are perhaps less serious on the surface, but critical, fundamentally. Uh, Florence, tell us a little bit about how, and we'll get to questions and whatnot soon, but tell us a little bit about how you perceive the world has changed from the perspective of your off the menu and, and, and your, your, your reporting for the Times. In the last 10 years alone, in the last 20 years, 30 years, fine, but in the last 10 years alone, tell us a little bit about the jump and the shift, and you can mention that other thing that you had mentioned to me, that other a uh, source of information that sometimes makes you cranky? Okay. Speak into the microphone, if you Okay. Would. Well, let me just embellish the Park Avenue potluck mention. Oh, okay. This is a uh, benefit cookbook for the Society of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So it's a fundraiser. And the contributors are the kinds of ladies who go and buy Nan Kempner's uh, used clothes the last couple days, but you know, uh, it was, it's really interesting. I mean, there's a cocktail in there called pond water. Don't ask. <laughs> I tested all the recipes. I had a great, great good time doing them. Well, you know, I come to this with a very academic background. I am really a researcher. I love to dig. And if 
And when I stop learning in the course of doing what I'm doing, I'm, it's over for me. It's been an education, and because I am a researcher by nature, a graduate degree in French, I lived in, in France, um, what I bring to the whole food world is a background that goes back to my childhood because my parents, back in the 40s and 50s, before most of you were born, were foodies. You, uh, Michael talked about restaurant associates. They opened a new restaurant. My mother and father were there. We were at the Four Seasons. We were at the Fonda del Sol. We were having dinner in, I lived in Westchester, we were having dinner in Manhattan in these restaurants and my parents were passionate about the latest restaurant. And let me tell you something, in those days, it took some digging to find out about the latest restaurant. Craig Claiborne took his merry old time and re reviewed Lutece a year, one year after the place opened. Can you imagine? <laughs> This doesn't happen today. It doesn't happen. It didn't happen 10 years ago. Uh, it is so instantaneous now. There is such a passion for it. I catch my breath or try to, keeping up with what's going on. And the landscape, as Clark uh, mentioned, has really changed. Uh, I don't come into this with a... I've acquired on the fly a big food training because at one time for a series of years, I reviewed all the cooking schools and wine schools in New York, and believe you me, that was an education. I've also worked in the kitchen with many, many chefs. My uh, fluency in French has helped there. Uh, there was a time when if a French chef was in town and at a dinner, they parked me next to him because I could at least chit-chat. Um, but today, the level of interest is both much more intense and at the same time, I think much more superficial because it's the 15 minutes of fame in spades. Uh, the blogs have taken over. They'll mention something, and then three days later, they move on without digging, without caring, without even understanding what's going on. The food landscape today is harder to track, harder to keep up with, but more exciting than ever for many reasons. Number one, because despite the superficiality of a lot of the uh, reports in both the media and online, at the same time, I think the chefs today are much more caring about what they do and caring on a level that goes well beyond just the mere ingredient or the recipe. They are caring about the environment. They are caring about their customers. They are caring about wine. There is a whole paradigm of uh, elements that mesh together in a way they never did before. And to me, this is incredibly exciting. At the same time, the uh, there is an element of the dining public that follows this and that also cares and that is very educated about this. I think the fact that you are here and that a lot of you are being educated and studying what's going on has put a different face on the world of food and restaurants. It's much harder to satisfy us and I think that's a good thing. Uh, there is an element of the food of the dining public that you know is happy going into the neighborhood place and if they do the flounder without any butter they're you know content and they go home and read their newspaper and go to bed that's fine on a certain level but at, on the other hand there is another larger public I believe that follows the chefs and the ingredients and how the farmers contribute and how the environment plays into this and the whole green restaurant movement which is just starting. There are elements here that, n that never existed and that I find incredibly exciting and that keep me energized in this field. Uh, and the fact that people are doing academic studies. When I graduated college, believe you me, food was not a career choice ridiculous. Um, I cooked. I cooked very well. My mother was a terrific cook, and I'd always cooked, but the thought of making food a career, please. Um, I bided my time. I 
took uh, a degree in French mainly so I wouldn't lose all the effort I had put into learning the language. And on a kind of ad hoc level, I got involved in the food field because I cared back in the early 70s about what kind of tomatoes I bought. I cared about the lettuce. I cared about uh, the berries and the fruits. And I started thinking about what I bought when and in what season. Um, I think before a lot of my peers did, a lot of people that I associated with did. And I sort of was a flag bearer for this kind of thing. And it was because of that that I started writing. Uh, I was kind of between jobs. I won't bore you with those details. But the fact is I started writing about food, a column called In Season for the East Hampton Star. I was lucky to have been going out to the Hampton since I was like the age of 12. But at a time when there were farms and more farms than there are today and there were fishermen and and I began to understand what the product meant and understood the difference in the flavors that you got when somebody put their freshly picked tomatoes on a card table on their front lawn versus what you could buy in the supermarket and I pitched the idea of writing about this to this weekly newspaper and the editor said well do a sample and I said, how many words? And he said, 400. <laughs> and I wrote my 400 words in three weeks. Uh, I wish I'd had more time. <laughs> and the thing took off to the point where six months later, I was writing for the New York Times. Um, stories like that don't happen today on a regular basis. And it's very hard for me to tell people who ask me how do I get started in this field what to do because my experience is so unusual and unique. But, but by the same token, it's something that we can, as a group, deconstruct with a perspective that maybe you don't have, that we get to have. I mean, the idea, the, the bottom line to me is you wrote a column called In Season. And the point is that you were busy getting your graduate degree in what to eat, what it tasted like at the beginning, which is a wonderful lesson for everybody here. It's called benchmarks, whether they be intellectual, academic, or visceral, right, taste benchmarks. You, you began yeah. by building that. And then I, before too long, I started reviewing restaurants for the Long Island section of the New York Times. And when you talk about benchmarks, one of the things I looked for were chefs that weren't putting a decorative strawberry on the duck breast in January, which a lot of them were doing. I mean, I ate some really terrible meals. The best assignment I ever had in my life was reviewing all the restaurants on the New Jersey Turnpike. <laughs> I'll tell you about the scrambled eggs at the Vince Lombardi. <laughs> but it's been a very interesting career, and I must say that today I find it more exciting than ever. And uh, I'm not bored, I'm not tired, I'm not jaded. And I think that what's happening right now is phenomenal. And I have nothing but deep, deep respect for the kind of expertise, caring, and really wonderful uh, appreciation that chefs and farmers and fishermen are, and all are bringing to this field. I remember when I started writing in East Hampton, you would have farmers who were growing potatoes, and the idea for them to vary their crop was unthinkable. I mean, farmers are so conservative in terms of what they do. Uh, and then they had a wake-up call. There was a time when they were shipping potatoes by the ton to Russia. That was over, and either they had to go out of business or diversify, and they did diversify. And Lo and, and behold. And lo and behold, the real estate in East Hampton has gone up just a sketch. Yeah, right. just a little. <laughs> All right, we're yeah. going to get to some other topics, but I want to hold, uh, hold you there because I want everybody to think about something that Florence said, the blogs out there. Okay? I mean, the truth of the matter is that when I heard that the New York Times was going to start their own blogs, I started to giggle. <laughs> Because people write blogs so that they can write for the New York Times. I mean, the, the point is, it's all an audition, folks, right? It's all an audition. So what I kept saying was, if a blog is in the New York Times, it means that it didn't get into the paper. It means that it wasn't quite important enough. But maybe that's not true. I want us to get back to the blogs and how this is. 
Well, I just heard today, I mean, I was talking to somebody who has a new food service, and she was so excited because of the blog called Midtown Lunch, and people are already posting stuff on this blog about this place that does some kind of a food thing in Midtown. I mean, who cares? Well, actually, I have to add one more blog comment, and then we're going to go on to our next speaker, and that was that I was with a woman who is in the West Coast. She's not here in the room. And she was insufferable and, and really uh, <laughs> deeply to all of us at, at this uh, particular grouping. And at one point, she said very loudly, I love blogs. There's no editor. Oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. We all kind of looked at each other and went, oh. we like one now, please. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go on to our next speaker so that we can have a little back and forth here before we all eat food and drink wine. Um, this gentleman uh, had it all. <laughs> he was the chef de cuisine of a four-star restaurant transplanted from uh, Paris to New York City, a dazzling jewel that still today is in my top three of best restaurants in America. It's probably, if I had to admit it, probably my favorite restaurant at that level in New York ever. It's called La Bernadette, have you heard of it? <laughs> right? And uh, uh, this is a man who uh, achieved great things, has, has done a lot of things on his own, uh, came from uh, uh, the Black Forest, Stuttgart, Stuttgart right? Right, originally. Baden Baden. Uh, what? Baden Baden. Baden Baden, excuse me. It's all about the water. <laughs> and uh, have, has cooked for and in the kitchens of some of the great uh, Michelin uh, uh, chefs. And, and by the way, you have a, a friend visiting, uh, Gunther Seeger from Atlanta is here in the back. Gunther, hello. How are you? <laughs> Welcome to New York. What a surprise. Yeah, right. ah. yeah, yeah, we're, we're getting the uh, Black Forest contingent together. Take a little hint. Um, anyway. Uh, Everhart was kind of, when he was at La Bernadette, kind of a poster child for how to be a success in a certain way of a classical tradition. And today, Everhart farms on Long Island <laughs> with his wife uh, um, and grows lettuces that uh, are so brilliant that Florence Fabricant writes about them in <laughs> Okay? How's that for organized? I did not plan this. They did not plan this. It just, it works out that way. Uh, first of all, please help me welcome Everhart Mueller. Thank you. I want you to talk a little bit about the uh, your little trajectory and how it feels to be a farmer uh, after having been a world uh, a famous, uh, um, uh, successful benchmark New York City chef. Well, the most important thing that changed is the the hours of the day that you that you get up and go to sleep. I mean, we're up for the chickens and we're in bed for the chickens. So that's a, a, a big change from, from what I used to do. We used to go to, to sleep at, at four in the morning or five in the morning after the fish market for a couple hours and then went back to, to party. <laughs> anyway, no, I, I started my career back in, in the Black Forest in Germany and in, in a restaurant in a classic tradition, a classic fashion apprenticeship. Started when I was 13 years old. Uh, did my apprenticeship for three years and moved through a number of restaurants in Germany and in Switzerland. And at the age of 20, I kind of say to myself, well, you can make 5,000 Swiss francs in Switzerland a month or you can go to France and really learn how to cook. And that's what I did. I, w I went to Paris at uh, the age of 20 and uh, spent six years, almost seven years in Paris at uh, some of some very famous restaurants. One of them being Larchestrat with Alain Sanderlans. I spent there four years with him. And from Paris, I got the opportunity to travel with Alain Sanderlans and we came to New York and uh, I was actually Michael's predecessor at Windows on the World. Um, from 1982 to 1985. And then when the Le opened, Le Bernardin, they called me because they knew of me through Alain Sanderans in, 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 uh, in Paris. And um, basically, I, I, Gilbert hired me and, and, and um, I spent six years with him in, at the Bernardin's kitchen where to fairly decent success, I would say. Yeah. Um, what was very interesting, when I lived in Paris, and before that, I mean, my parents had a garden at home, and it was kind of, we, I grew up in a bakery, my parents owned a bakery, we had a big orchard, we had fruit trees, we had uh, apple trees, pear trees, plum trees, peaches, strawberries, the whole nine yards. And um, 
we would we would grow we we ate strawberries in in may and june and we ate raspberries in 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 Ju in, in july and and uh plums in 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 august and and uh apples and pears in the winter and not not in december you know we would we would have seasonal fruits and seasonal vegetables like it ought to be and when i came to this country especially here in new york or if that's the only place i really have been in new york it was very difficult for me to 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 find the kind of produce and the kind of products that i was accustomed to from europe and i think it was the biggest the biggest challenge was to find real good produce um that was not that didn't taste like cardboard for the longest time and so so when when i worked with Gilbert, he he made me he made me go out and look um when we opened the bernarda we started flying in baby lettuces mescla from california we were the first restaurant in new york city i believe to 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 serve mescla baby leaf at 30 dollars a pound at the time <laughs> okay <laughs> I was the first chef in New York City to bring in Yukon gold potatoes because we weren't satisfied with the, with the Idaho potatoes and the potatoes that were available commercially. We brought in potatoes from, I believe it was Minnesota. Somebody grew Yukon gold yeah. potatoes and they were like $12 a pound. I mean, ridiculous. It didn't matter because we needed the best products that we, that money could buy and we, we just bought it and, and, and we sold it to people for a ridiculous amount of money. <laughs> anyway. Um, I moved on from from the Bernarda. I went to in a short period to a restaurant in in LA, Opus, and opened that as a seafood restaurant as well. And it was kind of very interesting because um, produce in California at that time was what it is today in New York, I believe. You know, and it was a real eye opener for me because I didn't realize that there was really this kind of quality product available to people. You could buy tomatoes and you could buy fresh peaches and you could buy strawberries that really tasted like like fruit. And when I came back to New York, um, when I met my wife, Paulette Sada, we got married. We bought this property in, in on the North Fork of Long Island. and. We bought 18 acres, way more than we actually needed. But uh, <laughs> the intention was that we were going to have a nice spread for ourselves and then and then uh, do some do some gardenings on the weekends. And it just didn't work out that way because every weekend, every time I came out on the weekends, the weeds were this high and the uh, and the tomatoes were wilted and the uh, and the uh, and the beans looked like like terrible. And uh, so I said, well, we have to do something. So. We, we hired somebody to run, to, to farm for us or grow the vegetables for us so I could, I could bring them in. And it was very important because it made a big difference in what we, what we served at, at the time. I was at Lutes. I ran Lutes for six years, as you might know, um, after Andre retired. And I, I started bringing in produce that we grew out in the farm. And, and, uh, and uh, it was really, really an eye opener for me to, to see how differently you can cook when you really had good, great ingredients. And soon enough, some of our friends, my chef friends and, and people around, the and town, around town asked if they could buy from us. And so we, we started growing a little bit more. Make a long story short, we now farm 140 acres and supply every major restaurant in New York City and some of the grocery stores. And the other thing that is really interesting is, uh, and that, has to do with what Florence has been doing and what Mario Nestle has been doing, what everybody around in this room has been has been doing. There is a groundswell going on in, in, in this industry and in the farming industry right now. We have been, this is the first year, the first year in, in, in nine years since we are out there that local grocery chains like Passmark, D'Agostino, Food Emporium, all these companies have contacted us. They have come out, they try to buy a product from us. It's absolutely amazing to me. I mean, what's going on there is your- wait, wait, wait. American grocery stores want to buy fresh produce from farms? From local farms, from local <laughs> oh, no. farms. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. I mean, 10 years ago, you couldn't, you couldn't, 
you could kill somebody with what peaches they, they serve. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and today it's a different story. It's right, amazing. We're, we're going to get to some other issues. First, let's give uh, Everhart a big round of applause. Thank you. But I want to do, do a couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, Tosca's going to pass out, pass out some cards if you have a question. Obviously, the reason we gather afterwards in the other room is so you can attack these. I mean, ask these people <laughs> directly your questions about your career and your thoughts and whatnot. And that's we want to give you access to those people. But in the meantime, uh, I should also mention that we have another friend here who's part of our ongoing faculty. Uh, Scott Peacock just won a Beard Award for the best chef in his region. He also comes from Atlanta. And let me just tell you something. When Watershed produces and shares with you a plate of vegetables, it's a special thing indeed as well. Please welcome Scott Peacock. Come on. Please. And what I loved about what Scott said it, to me recently is, you know, they're very famous for their Tuesday night fried chicken. And he said that the couple from Mexico that cooks it deserves every award, which is a really important topic as well. Tosca, she's going to pass these out. If you have a question, write it down in, in French, and Florence will translate for you. <laughs> but now we're going to go on to Mary Nessel, who is going to ra uh, kind of give us a perspective. She's been listening intently, writing notes in, uh, no, she hasn't. She knows all this stuff. <laughs> Mary, uh, you really were uh, the leader, in my opinion, uh, in the reexamination and reordering of, of academic education. And you have apparently been reason reasonably successful in your field. Uh, you are probably uh, <laughs> among the several most quoted and referred to scientists, certainly anybody who knows about food uh, in the country, possibly in the world. She didn't go to Davos this year because they didn't want all the movie stars this time. You know, <laughs> you know. but, but, but also recently have accepted a, a, a seat as a sociologist, uh, which I think is really a fascinating uh, evolution of, of the work that you've been doing. Tell us a little bit about your perspective, where you think this last 10 years um, has been going, and, uh, and what you think the benchmarks are. Please, everybody, welcome Mary Nessel. I better start with the benchmark, and it's a confession. I'm blogging. <laughs> Reluctantly, with deep reluctance, but I started about a couple of weeks ago, whattoeatbook.com. Um, and part of the reason why I started was that I was invited to write an essay for Publishers Weekly on books that made the food revolution. And um, I thought about it for a long time, and this is, fits right in with the kind of thing that Clark was talking about earlier. And I wrote about the three books that I thought were revolutionary, and they were uh, Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French cooking, Sidney Mintz's Sweetness and Power, and Fast Food Nation. And I wrote up this essay and talked about some other books, Laura Shapiro's amongst others, um, and they rejected it. Um, they, said, they said it was, it's been a long time since I've had a paper rejected. <laughs> uh, and so you know, I had this essay, so I started my blog with that essay, and I'm now posting comments on it every day and trying to figure out how to do it and why I'm doing it. And as I say, there's a fair amount of reluctance. But part of it was I was really pushed into this by um, not only my publisher, who was very interested in having me do this, but also by um, a group of people who were very involved in blogging who tell me this is where the future lies, we'll find out. Um, in any case, this all, Clark wanted me to review a little bit about where this all started 11 years ago, and it started on this famous walk that Clark and I did from the mid-70s down to the village, uh, in which we dreamed up the idea of food studies, and both of us had been dealing with um, academics, writers, and chefs and were aware that there was a tremendous amount of interest in food from an academic standpoint and no outlet or inlet for uh, doing anything about it. And an opportunity arose at NYU. Um, there was just this, you know, one of those open doors and we walked right into it and were able to start undergraduate masters and doctoral degrees in food studies 10 years ago um, that have graduated a lot of graduates who are doing lots of interesting things. Uh, one of our recent graduates is the food editor for um, the New York Daily News that's not the New York Times, but it's not bad for a recent college graduate either. Um, the, uh, 
the development of food studies came about, I think, because of what we saw as tremendous interest in food as a field of study and a lack of opportunity elsewhere. We were hearing from students in anthropology, sociology, American studies, history, and so forth, that if they wanted to write about, do their dissertations on food themes, that there was nobody in their fields to supervise their dissertations. And food was considered quotidian. It was considered too common and too trivial to waste four or five or six or seven or eight years of dissertation research on, and they were discouraged from doing that. And we thought that was um, not very far-sighted and developed our own doctoral program. And what is really remarkable to me is how much things have changed. For the last eight years, we've run a colloquium um, of food researchers, academics uh, who have academic jobs, doctoral students, and some food writers who do research with footnotes. Um, and at the beginning, when that colloquium started, it was the only place where doctoral students uh, could come and find academics who would take their work seriously and give them good critical feedback. Now, if a doctoral student in just about any field you can think of suggests to a, a faculty member that they'd like to do something about food, they're welcomed with open arms. And in a sense, food studies has become irrelevant to the greater academic enterprise. And as a, you know, I would say that in my own case, I was invited by the sociology department at NYU, which is in arts and sciences, not the School of Education. These differences are very important um, to join as a faculty member. And I, I don't think that would have happened 10 years ago. Um, I accepted immediately. I was very <laughs> pleased. So I'm now a sociologist practicing without a license. I just love it. Um, so much so that I'm teaching a course in food sociology in the fall with a uh, sociology faculty member. It'll be fun. Um, so I think we've come a long way. And some of the indicators of how, how far we've come are just reading the change in the kinds of stories that the New York Times is writing about, uh, the kinds of things that were when Florence used to be the only person who was writing about these things, now everybody is writing about these things. And the New Yorker nation, the nation, um, and what's the other one that did spell? Oh, the New York Times Book Review did special issues on food. Uh, it is now considered, I mean, it's, they're still being handled in sort of a, well, it's kind of a cute, funny subject. Um, but I think it's being taken much more seriously. And those of us who are involved in the academic enterprise around food uh, can, can hardly keep up with the tremendous amount of scholarly work that's being done, M much of it very, very good. Well, that's a very good start. All right, I want to start with a couple of questions, and then Tosca will bring me some of yours. There has been a lot made of, uh, of background and history. And uh, Eberhard mentioned a chef who has actually, um, he was certainly part of my early education about world-class cooking, but he was one of, the, of those Parisian chefs who gave back his Michelin star, unless I don't know, because somehow they weren't relevant or too hard to uh, live up to or not profitable uh, economically or just a pain in the neck. Uh, with, you know, because the sconces in the bathrooms were just more than he wanted to have. If any of you would like to respond to the fact that um, people are kind of changing what they consider to be the validation markers of successful cooking and successful food, uh, food and restauranting, um, and how that works. Florence, you're you're always covering the Michelin. Give us a word about that. Well, you know. Um there have been a handful of restaurants in Europe, restaurateurs in, power, in France, who have decided that they will refuse their Michelin stars. I think it's kind of grandstanding because the fact is that Alessandro Ons now has a less pretentious, cheaper restaurant. And yes, he has two stars. Uh, uh, Joël Robuchon retired, quote unquote. And then, lo and behold, he opens L'Atelier, and that has a Michelin star. La Tabla has two Michelin stars, and he's back in the game in a di somewhat different format. And the fact is that today in Paris, and believe you me, I was there two weeks ago, it is very hard to get a table in any Michelin three-star restaurant. 
So the death of the Michelin star chef is not computing. And I have to say, while we went to a couple of them, um, a great majority of the clientele were Americans. There were some French there as well. Um, I think what has changed, though, is the kind of focus throughout the whole industry. It's not just the top, the Bernadans and so forth, that are attracting the attention, the, the 21s, the windows on the world, the historic markers. It's every little, I mean, if you read some of the blogs, the minute uh, plywood goes up on, the, on a storefront uh, in the East Village, everyone gets gaga. And then, you know, so that at every level of the industry now, there is an incredible amount of scrutiny, deserved or not. And the fact is, it's all fair game. And I think that, that Number one, the speed with which information is disseminated. Number two, the amount of focus that's put on all of this. And the fact that everybody who eats in these places can post their opinion, uh, whether it's uh, valid or not. I am a believer in expertise. I am not a believer that everybody can judge everything. I think that the death of culture comes when you no longer have schooled critics. And it, it pains me to see the validation given to ordinary people's opinions. The people that stand up at the end of a Broadway show and applaud and they all give these standing ovations no matter what it is. I mean, they could give a standing ovation in no matter what, what restaurant in the East Village or the Lower East Side or Williamsburg. What you're saying is that Clay Aiken is still going to sell more albums than Ruben Stoddard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more or less. It's not but just a popularity. Yeah, problem. and I think, I think it makes it harder for all of us to sort it all out. I, I, I just want to say, yeah, you know, I so. agree with you completely. I, I've always taken criticism very, very seriously. I mean, to the extent that. Uh, the the writer who would write something critical about my restaurant, I, I really would read it, you know, not not try to read the tea leaves, but try to see what can I learn from the experience of that writer's experience, because I would have respect for that writer. There's so many voices speaking at once, it's sort of hard to kind of do that now. I mean, I, I, you know, in the earlier part of my career, those critical reviews were important, not only for the validation, uh, and the criticism, good or bad, but in in the notes, and this probably I learned as an actor. You know, you, you get you get a chance to see someone else's opinion, uh, and what is what, you know what? How do you come across, and you can better your restaurant? One thing you said it took a year for Craig to write about Lutes. The interesting thing is now it happens so quickly that the restaurants don't even get a chance to really develop a, a little bit. You know, um, a show would be in previews in Chicago, and now they open in New York, and you know, there's so much money invested, it's, it's actually hard to get a little bit of time under your belt before the, the restaurant has a chance to fully develop. But because there's so many voices at once, but still uh, the, the trained professional critic is the voice that I think is the most important. Marion, talk to us about the fact that the high-end restaurants and local produce are at one end of the food news, but the other is that kids are getting bad food and getting diabetes and getting obese and all the rest of it. What has this educational process to do with that entire conversation? Uh, I think everybody is concerned about what's going on with kids in marketing and that's and marketing and food and that's certainly my specific area um, and it's part of our department's courses on food politics and contemporary issues in food and it's very much um, the educational process is very much about what's going on in society and the role of food in society so that would be a big part of the conversation we like to train our students to be activists and advocates also for the kinds of things they believe in Everhart, uh, tell us a little bit about along those lines the certification of organics or natural and its impact not just on uh, I mean, on your, on your work on the farm, not just the rarity or the perhaps social value of a particular variety and the flavor, but how important has that been in the whole mix of what you guys are doing? Well, the problem with, with organics today, and, and I'm, we are not certified organic. We are, we're, gro we're growing by, by organic standards as far as can be. Um, the reason why we are not certified organic is because we are surrounded by vineyards and vineyards spray 
they have to spray on on the North Fork. Um, the problem the problem with the organics has become, and that's my personal opinion, um, a lot of agri businesses, big agri businesses, have actually gone into the to the organic growing and food is grown in Arizona or in, in California, it's still going to travel from California to New York and it's it's defeating the purpose of what organics is all about. We're still polluting the environment more than if we would grow it locally and it's still it, we're still not we're still doing a lot more harm than we're doing beneficials. So I think you have to you have to to sort through this here a little bit and and i'm a big believer and a big defender of of local organics <coughs> as opposed to organics period from, from a far distance go ahead Boy. well there you know i liken what's happened with organics in a way to the automobile industry uh about 10 years ago i wrote a story for the times a cover story on organic produce and how uh, most of the supermarket managers I spoke to said, ridiculous, nobody will spend the money. That was like the automobile industry saying, ridiculous, we can't even put in seat belts because nobody is going to want to spend the extra money. And now they're saying the same kind of ridiculous nonsense about, uh, 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 no, about the uh, gas mileage, the fuel, fuel mileage. The, the car companies are again saying it's going to cost the consumer money. Well, the consumer is smarter than the big co corporations and they are willing to spend the money when they understand the benefit and today organics have gotten to be very big now as Eberhard says it's agribusiness but at the same time I'd rather have that agribusiness than Roundup well and, and but as Mary Nessel said when Michael Pollan in a recent conversation said that wouldn't it be great if McDonald's uh, used organics and in fact in some McDonald's you get mescaline that you're talking about you get yourself. Paul Newman coffee too yeah, but there you go uh, what Marion's response was was that junk food that's organic is junk food. Uh, two more questions, and then we're all going to have some actually some of the benefit of two uh, very generous folks. One is Peter Mandavi Jr., who has been a sponsor of this whole series, including the symposium. And we have some lovely wine directly from him. He's not here today. He likes to join us when he can, but he couldn't be here today. But he sends his regards and his wine in that order. Um, and the other is that we have some nibbles from a wonderful restaurant uh, near where I live downtown called My House, M-A-I House. Michael, whose last name I can't pronounce, Huyen, is from Vietnam. He takes groups of chefs to Vietnam and shows them the difference in cuisine and the influences of France and various other invading countries uh, to his historical background. <laughs> it's a Drew restaurant and the food is really quite extraordinary. But the two, um, the two questions I have to throw at the group as a whole uh, because one of them is a, a brilliant question, the other one has been asked three times in only five cards. Um, one is, and I love this, do you feel that the best food writers, James Beard and um, uh, Michael Lamonaco are both actors and performers first, the best food writers are, fo are people who start writing um, from other disciplines, start working from the arts per se, or journalists who turn their pen to food, that are from a background of deep education and culture, or from being a good journalist? Marion? I don't think it matters. Okay. As long as they're smart and careful? As long as they're smart and careful. And I deal with food writers every day, and I think they're among the smartest people I know. Because they see, uh -huh. because they're looking at the role of food in society, they're looking at the big picture all the time, and they, they and putting things in context. Very impressive group. You, you need to also answer the question several times asked, what is food sociology? I don't know yet, <laughs> All right. well, but I will by September. <laughs> Ask me again in September. <laughs> On Monday, actually, we're going to do a little gathering at um, uh, my house uh, between 5 and 6.30. It's going to be uh, an artisan uh, handmade jewelry sale for a friend of ours. It's going to be at my house. They're going to be hosting some nibbles. There'll be a cash bar. The reason I'm telling you all this is that some of the proceeds will go to this collection, raise a couple of bucks to catalogs and Spell books. my. M-A-I. <laughs> right, not my house. Forget it. <laughs> uh, so if you want to, please join us. But please also now join these wonderful people uh, in a little reception in the gallery next door. But first, before you do that, please let's thank them.